Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ruse. I'm uh, working in customer support with Gradle for five and a half years now, and uh, mostly helping with Tony. We've been helping uh, uh, users and customers adopt their tools, become proficient in tools, and especially with caching, right? That's the big topic, caching, and that's why we're here today. Yeah, and I'm Tony Robolik. I am a software engineer at Gradle, and uh, I've been focused on customer support primarily, um, working on the Gradle Enterprise team, um, helping to make the Gradle Enterprise tool more effective for our customers. And before that, I was in uh, the Android team lead for chess.com, so we were actually rewriting our app from scratch so with modern architecture and uh, in Kotlin. You want to run through the agenda for today? Yeah, so the agenda's pretty straightforward. Um, we actually have people from sort of all walks of life, as it were. We have uh, software developers, we have build masters, we have um, managers. And so I think to get started, it makes sense to just talk about build catch basics really quickly, just so we're all on the same page as, to, as far as how the build catch works. Once that's complete, we'll just talk about the benefits of the build catch. That is, why would you even bother using it? And then I'll talk into the sort of the, the meat or the tofu <laughs> of the discussion will be uh, build cache monitoring, uh, debugging, acceleration, how that can accelerate your build. And then we'll talk about um, build cache replication. That is, if you have a globally distributed team, how do you make the build cache work in that scenario? And then finally, of course, we'll have time for Q&A. Ruse? All right, so uh, we want to talk about the impact of caching on developer productivity, right? In the last few years since we launched uh, the cache for Gradle, the remote and local cache, right, we've seen uh, a lot of folks have been interested in how do I improve build times? And well, one of the best ways is with caching. And the impact is fairly huge, right? So the Gradle team ourselves, right, we were one of the first folks that really dog-fooded this uh, cache quite well. Uh, we, sa we save around every 60 days, around 24 hours. Tableau, one of our customers and users, they're saying they save around 15 hours every two weeks, right? So it's one of the biggest low-hanging fruits, mm -hmm. but it's not that easy, as we will uh, learn more today. Let's start with our first poll. All right. So who's using the build cache today, right? That's what we want to know. So let's kick this poll off here. All right. So we got 35% using the local cache only and good amount of folks not using um, the, the build cache and only 6% using the remote cache. Yeah, that's, that's pretty interesting if you're using the remote cache only. Um, we'll get more into that, I guess, later. So let's, uh, let's keep going. All right, so build cache basics. How, what is the build cache? How does it work? So at a sort of a high level, um, the way the Gradle build cache works, it's almost like an extension of, of incremental build, which is all those up-to-date checks you see in your, in your build. Whenever Gradle, you ask Gradle to invoke a task, say clean or, um, or check or test or build, Gradle build, it computes, it looks at all the inputs to that task, It'll compute a hash of those inputs and create what is called a cache key from those hashes. And then it will look in the, the build cache, either the local build cache or the remote build cache, and if it finds that cache key, gets the, gets the cache hit, and it will take those outputs from the build cache and then substitute them into your build. If there's a cache miss, then it has to execute the task, which obviously will take longer than pulling it from the build cache. The reason I have uh, the final bullet point on the screen is build cache always on is that there is never a scenario in which it makes sense to turn the build cache off. Just that's the point I want to hammer home um, repeatedly throughout this presentation. We all are familiar with the idea of having um, of dry code, you know, don't repeat yourself, don't do anything twice. It's the same with the build. We want to have dry builds. Don't build something twice if you can only build it once. That's what the cache is all about. And that's what you mean by dry. Yeah, yeah, just dry builds, do it once and only once. And what, what does this uh, uh, diagram do? I, I think um, maybe you can sure, double so. click on that a bit for the folks here. No problem. So um, this diagram is sort of a visual representation of what I just said, which is you invoke a Gradle build, um, and then the first thing it's going to do is if that task is already up to date and it's like local memory, it'll just be up to date. It, won't have to, it will not have to run the task again. If, however, the task is not up to date, um, Gradle will try. Will then look in the local cache to see if that task has been run um, anywhere in the past. And if, it, if that's the case, it'll pull that task from the cache and substitute the outputs, saving you the time from executing the task. If it's not in the local cache, then it goes to the remote cache. And um, so that's where the remote cache really comes into play, is you can share those outputs across your entire team and CI infrastructure. So again, it's not, not just having dry builds locally, but dry builds across your entire team. Um, if it's a cache hit on the remote cache, it'll then copy that output 
into the local cache so that next time it'll be, it'll be faster. So every consecutive build, you know, after this pulling in from the remote cache is going to get faster because it's going to auto-populate. Exactly. Remote. And you don't have to do anything to, to no, it's, make that, it's just uh, It's totally, trans pilot. totally transparent, Gradle black handles magic. all that for you. Gonna... Oh, there's no black magic ruse at all. <laughs> <laughs> it all makes sense. Great. Okay, so for the folks on the webinar, everybody gets how the, the cache works. There's a little raise your hand tool on GoToWebinar that uh, you can use to say, uh, uh, you know, uh, so raise your hand if that didn't make sense or if it's still not clear on how the cache works. Okay, so we got a couple of folks that's still not clear on the, how the cache works. A and uh, you can uh, message us uh, the question of exactly what you're not sure about how the cache works and we're gonna get to it at the end. Yeah, we'll do all the Q&A at the end. All right, so one thing, Tony, I get this question all the time, right? Hey, I'm already doing caching with Artifactory or Maven Central. Why do I need a, a cache if I'm already doing that, right? So, right. so w but that's different than what, we, what we're talking about today, right? Exactly, so uh, this is a common question we get for people who are new to the build cache. Um, it is a different thing than a binary repository. And when I say binary repository, I mean something like, like an Artifactory that hosts your libraries all your dependencies, everything that you see in the dependencies block of your Gradle build script, those are your binary dependencies and those come from a binary repository like Artifactory. Um, the build cache is not that. Um, it is sort of, it is, well, if the binary uh, repository is everything that's external to your build, the build cache is everything that's internal to your build. It's every task itself can be cached as opposed to the output of the, of the, the entire build. So it's, a, it's a sort of like a within build thing. Does that so, make sense? So you're essentially caching every step in the build process. Exactly, every step right. gets cached. And that's what makes it super fast. Right. And that's what you meant by dry build. So hey, yeah. I've already done this, it's up to date, don't do it again. Exactly, right, exactly. Awesome. Yeah, and to make that a bit more clear, we have a, an example, a concrete example of that, which is uh, caching test execution. This is something you can't do with, say, Artifactory or Maven uh, Central. Uh, but with the build cache, you can. Let's say you have some expensive uh, integration tests as part of your test suite. And then, um, so you run all your tests, it takes a few minutes or maybe even a few hours in some really bad cases. And then you make a small incremental change to your code, you say change one line of code in one of your modules. And then obviously you want to rerun the tests for that module. But there's no reason to rerun the tests from all the other modules that didn't change. And so Gradle, the Gradle build cache has your back, uh, keeps your builds dry. And um, all those other tests, all, their, uh, all the, will just come from the build cache. So the reports are already there and they're done. And then it's delivered to you. So and this is for unit tests mm -hmm. and integration tests? Yeah, anything that's a test wow, task. Okay. Yeah. And that's why we've seen you know, uh, that uh, the remote cache is just really doing really well with improving CI build. Time, Absolutely, right? It's just right. Caching those, that's why we have these long Gradle core builds that are now super fast. Right. And okay. Yeah, if you're, if you're continuously integrating, um, then your CI builds will, every, every build will be just a little bit different than the build before it, which means it gets a lot of benefit from that build cache. So one question with regards to that, that I got from the folks, can you give a specific example of cache versus binary? So i.e. Gradle 3.5 is local, so caching downloads uh, 4.5.1 and caches it locally? Right, well that's what I was just trying to give here, is that you, you, you don't host your test executions in a binary repository. This, it's not like a library that your, that your, um, that your software product consumes. Um, it's something, but it's something that only the build cache, the Gradle build cache can provide. So, so it's basically only caching dependencies versus we're caching every step, every step of, of the, build. the build process, including the test. Yeah, it's like caching the build process versus caching the published artifacts of some, of say JUnit is a, an example of something that you would import into your build in the dependencies as an external dependency. Let's do uh, another poll. All right, so uh, what are you building today, right? So that's the poll. So Tony, this cache works for, for everyone, right? If you're building Java, Android, uh, C, C++, if you're using the Gradle plugins, this is, works for everything. That's right? correct, yes. All right, so let's see uh, what folks are building today. All right, so Java's the winner, right? Lots of Android. And I'm excited that uh, native folks are in here as well. That's pretty cool. Curious about the other. Yeah. So, yeah, send us your others. We'd love to. Uh, so we got some Golang. Nice, building Golang with Gradle. Nice. That's the build cache basics out of the way. Let's talk about, in more detail, 
why you would want to use the build cache. So Tony, one thing, right, I, th I think it'd be interesting to share, right? I I've been pretty impressed. I mean, I haven't read code in a very long time, but I've been pretty impressed, right, of how well we are using the cache internally, right, with uh, how uh, CI populates the cache. We have, uh, at Gradle today, we have multiple different teams all over Europe, right? Uh, uh, Asia, Australia, all over the US, right? So it's not an easy thing. So I think it'd be really cool to kind of share, you know, how we are pulling this off. Right, so there are three primary scenarios in which the, the build cache really helps out with local builds. That is, builds on your local development machine. And uh, the first one is the first build of the day. So let's imagine that you, um, you have your morning coffee, you turn on your computer at 7 or 8 or 9 a.m., depending on when you like to get up, um, and you pull master, and then you turn, open up your IDE. And the first thing you're going to see is, of course, it's going to be syncing, right? Uh, but then it's going it's to try to build the project. And uh, if you're not using the build cache, that could take a while if you have a big project. But with the build cache, you're going to find that most of those um, sort of interbuild components, that, that process we talked about, have already been built on CI, right? So um, Gradle will pull those uh, components, those uh, build outputs um, from, from the CI build down to your local development machine, and it could save you a tremendous amount of time. I think we see like 40% or more um, build speed improvement with uh, just on that first build of the day. So it just makes your morning a little bit a little bit sweeter. And the first build of the day totally sucks for everybody. I mean, the bigger your project yeah. gets, you know. You've got a cold Gradle daemon, um, you know, you've got, you just opened up Slack and you have 30 Chrome tabs and it's all consuming memory and CPU time. So you want to make sure that that first build is fast. And that's, where, that's where the build cache has your back. So, so the remote cache, the big benefit of the remote cache, usually the first build of the day, you know, and, and then the local cache kind of takes over. Right. And, yeah, and then um, the other two examples are like switching branches and updating your branch. So in branch-based development, it's really common that uh, your colleague, you know, she has a PR, it's been, built, it's been built on CI, she wants you to review her code, and so you want to see it in action. So you check out her branch, um, and you build it, um, but because it's already been built on CI, it's been built somewhere, and it's populated the remote build cache, you can, again, you can build her branch much faster than if you had to build it all from scratch on your own machine. So that's, that's also a really big use case for the, the build cache, both local and remote. And then the final example is um, when you're just, uh, in the middle of the day, you're updating your branch uh, from, with upstream changes. So you're pulling master, you're rebasing your branch or something, you're merging code in. And once again, um, that code has already been built somewhere else in the world. So keep your builds dry, build, build only once. And um, that's, where, that's where the build cache really, really kicks butt. All right. All right, let's move on. So CI builds, right? We, we, I talked about this earlier. Like one thing I'm seeing from our users, right, when we are doing Gradle Enterprise customer support, checking in, right, and looking at the dashboards, right, from our users, it's the remote cache is just crushing it with CI builds. Yeah. You know, I'm seeing around 40%, right, on, on, on you. So how does that, how does that really work, right? Because you're supposed to run clean for CI, right? right? So I get that question a lot, mm -hmm. but Caching CI, right? I mean, we brought up the tests, right? But with the clean, how does that work? Because I get that question a lot. Right, so it's, it's very common to run, uh, all your CI builds are clean builds. And the reason this is the case is that we want to ensure that there are no sort of incremental task outputs present in the build. We want to have a clean sort of working space for the build. And so that's why we clean. We clean up all, and we clean up all the incremental outputs because it's, it's hard to get incremental tasks right sometimes. Um, the Gradle core tasks are all very well tested and we're confident that they work right, but if there's a custom uh, incremental task that could have a problem that's um, hard, to, hard to debug. And so we clean the, we clean the workspace and we run the build. Um, and so while it does improve safety, it does have a, like a, imposes a very heavy performance cost. The, those builds take a lot longer than if they were incremental builds. And so this is a case where the build cache really comes into play because it's caching all of those build outputs from each of those clean builds. And so like I said before, if you're continuously integrating, um, which we, what we all should be doing, uh, our code, then every one of your CI builds will only be a little bit different than the one before, for the most part, you know, in most cases. So uh, the second build versus the first build has a small change. You know, most of the outputs from the first build are still quite valid. And so the, the, build, the remote build cache, or even the local build cache, can. Um, yeah, so put, pull those outputs into the second build and save a tremendous amount of time. And we are seeing like really huge savings, um, cutting build time in half basically for, in, in many cases on CI. 
And one, one question I have here with regards to, I think it was from the last slide, but somewhat is, is applicable here. Um, build cache works for the same branch or between different branches? Yeah, between branches. The way the build cache works is it just it's completely agnostic as to where the build was run, whether it's CI or local, whether it was one run on branch A or branch B. All it cares about is the inputs and the outputs to a task. So the build cache, um, the way the build cache works is it computes the hash of every input to the task, creates a cache key from the aggregate of all those inputs, and then that key is valid. It doesn't matter where it was created, whether it was on your computer, your colleague's computer, your CI server, doesn't matter. And so, um, yeah, so it just doesn't matter what branch it's on. All right. There's a couple other points I think is useful to make here, which is um, it's becoming increasingly common for teams to use uh, what, what we call ephemeral build agents. And by that I mean like Docker, Docker containers so, or, or what have you. So if you're spinning up a Docker container, running a build, and then tearing it down, what that means <laughs> is that every build is on a fresh workspace, completely fresh. And so it's, once again, uh, the build cache has got your back. Um, it doesn't matter that it's in a Docker container. It, it can still pull those artifacts, those intra-build intra artifacts from the cache and save all that time and those ephemeral builds. And then the final point I want to make here is that um, we have seen uh, a number of teams have really, really interesting um, but quite complex uh, sort of hand-grown hand tooling for, for this problem. So they, want, they, they already have, they have, they have a very long CI build, so it might take an hour or more, and they want to make that build faster, which makes sense. We all might want to make our builds faster. And so they don't use the build cache yet. And what they do is they have this specialized tooling that they've written themselves that will, for example, parse git commits, looking for you know, which files have changed so that they can tell their CI agents you know, which, which parts of the build to run. And, um, and that works in some, in some cases, but it's, it's, you know, it's error prone, it's complex, hard to, it's hard to maintain. And what's really great about the build cache is it sort of, it can erase all that complexity. Because you just tell Gradle, build everything. Just build everything. And then um, it will already handle the cases for you where something has been built before and hasn't changed and pulled from the build cache. So just help Gradle build everything. And then the remote cache ensures that your build is dry. And you don't have to worry about all this complex, crazy tooling that you've written yourself. And that makes sense. Because uh, I've heard and been in discussions with multiple folks saying, hey, we are not using the cache. We don't trust it. We're not sure how reliable it is. And we've built some tooling around that that kind of makes your life uh, easier, right. which you know, you'll show in, in a few. Yeah, yeah. So um, the best thing I can say there is you should try it out. Uh, we have many large companies that use the build cache every day, producing hundreds of thousands of builds uh, daily. And build cache is absolutely essential to their workflow. And uh, what you will see um, in the next part of the presentation is all the tooling we have around the build cache to help you monitor it and ensure it's working the way you want it to work so you can have that confidence going forward. So um, I've talked a bit about CI. I want to describe kind of briefly how, um, how Gradle's CI works. Obviously, this is a very simplified diagram. Our build is much more complex than just this. But um, at a, a sort of a high level, what we have is this concept of a, of a seed build, which, um, which just compiles everything. Um, what it does is it, it compiles stuff for uh, text ex test execution for CI itself, and also compiles things that only developers might need, even if CI doesn't need it. CI doesn't need it. And the reason it does this is because it can populate the build cache with all those outputs so that developers, once again, um, can keep their builds dry. And this, um, this sort of fan out pattern we think is, is really useful. It's something that's enabled by the build cache, and we would actually recommend it if you're a build cache user. And I will, um, I'll show you how this works in more detail in a, in a little bit. The final thing I wanted to say in this section is not every task should be cacheable. Some tasks, for example, they're just faster to run than to pull from the cache. And an example of that is the jar task or a copy or a sync task. Those tasks are already just copying files, which is just what the build cache does. So there's no point in caching that because it's, like, it's just kind of redundant, right? It just wastes resources. And then um, another example of, of when it doesn't make sense to cache a task is uh, in an Android build, there's a task called uh, package application that builds your APK. It's probably the case that every one of your builds is going to result in a new APK file, right? You're going to change a resource, you're changing a line of code, you need a new APK to run, you know, to run your app. And in that case, if you're caching that task, you know, it's just a waste of time because every build is going to be different anyway, so it's just wasting resources. Um, but having said that, most tasks do benefit from the build cache, 
And once again, I want to reiterate that the build cache should always be on. There's never a use case that I can think of in which it makes sense to have the build cache off. And, and I have a question which re with regards to that that came from the beginning. So cache is enabled by default, uh, correct? And it works as long as it runs on the same machine? Um, that is not actually quite correct. Um, Double cache is not enabled by default. You have to enable it, and there's a couple of ways to do it, which um, there's various links at the bottom of these slides that sort of point to more resources. And of course, at the very end of the presentation, I have a slide with a bunch of links for, for further reading, and you can learn how to do that. But um, uh, just to really simply, the build cache is not enabled by default. You have to opt into it. Um, and uh, the build cache, once again, it does not matter which machine um, a build was run on. Uh, the build cache will pull those artifacts from any of those machines as long as you have remote caching enabled, and it'll just it'll just work. All right. Yeah. So um, one thing that uh, you know we get a lot from our users is that all right, I've, I've turned on the cache, I've even set up the remote cache, but it's not enough, right? This one and done just by turning it off, you know, I'm not getting I'm getting low cache hits. Mm -hmm. Please help me, right? And and I think that's one of the big areas why we're here. Right, and so why do we need to monitor caching? And, and maybe it's good to, to point out how we do it internally, right, yeah. uh, with Great All Enterprise? Absolutely. Right, so um, as Ruth said, it's not enough to just turn the cache on. You will certainly see a benefit if you do that, but it will not be the maximum benefit you could have. And uh, so we're going to show you how you can use Great All Enterprise to monitor the build cache. And one of the great things about build scans and Gradle Enterprise is it really helps to make the build transparent. Um, for a lot of users, uh, the build process is sort of like black magic, and we want to move away from that idea. We think that the build is a, is a manageable and maintainable thing, and it can be treated as such. And Gradle Enterprise really helps to, to prove that point, because it gives you all this insight into, ha into what happened during your build. Um, so it's incredibly useful. So the, the first thing, to your point, Ruth, about how to monitor the build cache effectiveness, the first thing that I do as someone trying to help out other teams um, making their builds faster via the build cache is I will look at um, what we call the performance dashboard. So let's do that right now. Right, so this is a, the, the Gradle Enterprise performance dashboard for the Gradle organization. Before I go into, into too deeply into what you're looking at, I want to just do some quick filters. Um, this is just the past day, by the way. This is in the past 24 hours. The Gradle organization has produced almost 10,000 builds, so we're we're cranking pretty pretty hard. Let's just look at Gradle core builds. Let's look at only successful builds. We already have that, and I want to look at the compile all builds. Okay, so now this is just in the past 24 hours. This is our seed build. This is the thing that seeds our build cache. We have it tagged with compile all. So just to um. I'll describe this, this is in detail before going into the build cache specific stuff because it's very interesting and useful. This view has a ton of uh, information in it and it's just really condensed and it's, it's quite, quite amazing. So starting from the bottom up, what you see is uh, this bar chart. Uh, every bar is a build. And if you click on a bar, you can navigate to the build scan for that build, which I'll do in a minute. And you see all these the summary statistics for the, the build. So I already know at a glance that in the past day, this compile all build has taken almost three minutes on average. And I see that uh, we've avoided <laughs> 18 and a half minutes um, from various Gradle perf performance enhancing features. So is that like real human time? Or how does, it, how does that work? If I really wanted to know like, you know, because some of that is incremental builds, right? And Right. And, yeah. You know, it's a good question. So um, well, to, to answer that, I need to take a quick step back and describe more how the, bar, how the bars are visualized. So the, the white circle in each bar is the actual build time. So this build, for example, only took um, just shy of two minutes to run. But you see the, the bar is much higher than that because it shows various performance aspects of that build. The blue color is uh, serial task execution. So that would be if every task ran in series or end to end, this is how long the build would take, almost 14 minutes. But in point of fact, the build takes just under three minutes. So there's a parallelization factor happening here. This build is very highly parallelized. Um, it's in fact 5.3 times faster than it would be if it all ran in series. So that's the blue bar. And then the gray you see here is going to be um, avoidance savings. And there's very, various aspects to that. So we have up-to-date checks. This is um, tasks that are already up-to-date. They're already sort of in memory in the Gradle daemon. They don't need to be re-executed re or pulled from the build cache. They're just already there. And then we have the local and the remote build cache. And we see here that um, these the two aspects of the cache together are 
you know, like 15 minutes. Um, but it's, again, it's not wall clock savings, it's not, it's not right. human savings, it's CPU time savings. To get the, um, the avoidance savings from a human perspective, we, the, the heuristic we use is you divide uh, this number 18 minutes by the parallelization factor, 5.3, and then that, that's, that's the human time savings. Now, I'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna embarrass myself trying to do math live, yeah, so but yeah. yeah. It's three, three, so, so, so around three minutes and some change on average, it's been saving, uh, and, and these are all local builds, yeah? No, these are, these are actually all CI builds in this case. CI yeah, it's the, yeah. The, uh, the CI is what runs the compile all task. So, um, so it's saving more, so it's decreased the build time by half. Yeah, so by- More than half. By a significant amount. Yeah. So it would have been six minutes if we, uh, on average, if we hadn't used this remote cache on these CI builds. That's exactly right. And so what you see here is if I, if I can click on any one of these and get more detail about it, and the one I'm interested in, in for this purpose is the avoidance savings. And I can see um, for each one of these builds, you know, the, the blue is local build cache and then the gray is the remote build cache and how they impact the, the speed of all of these builds. Now, um, so, this is, so again, this is what I do when I'm, just to remind everyone what we're doing here, is we want, to, we want to monitor the effectiveness of the build cache. And I can already see it's quite effective. The, the mean build time for these builds for the past day is about three minutes, but it's cutting that in half because it would have been twice as long without the build cache. So I already know that this build is pretty highly optimized. And then I can see that in more detail by navigating to one of these builds, uh, one of these build scans, and let's see what, that, see what that looks like. And if you wanted to recreate that dashboard, right, yourself, you, you'd need some sort of, I guess, hooks in the build system to right. send build times back to a spreadsheet or something and, and, and graph it. I, yeah. guess. I mean, I've seen other folks do this before with spreadsheet. Right. I mean, that's why we built this uh, product because we wanted to monitor that for ourselves. Yeah, we had a pretty uh, funny case where someone said, well, I could just do that with awk. <laughs> right, yes. I could parse build output with awk. I remember, uh, I remember that. I wonder if that person is, is on. I wouldn't necessarily recommend that. <laughs> so um, what you see here is a build scan for that build I, that I just clicked on. There was a lot of information here. and I could give a whole webinar just on this, this one view, when I, so I won't do that. But I want to show you is how you use the build scan to um, debug cache effectiveness. So let's, uh, the first thing I would do as, as someone who didn't know anything about this build is I would just make sure the cache is turned on. So I go down to switches and I see that the cache is on, these are all the Gradle switches. So the cache is on, we got continue on failure, uh, daemon and parallel are all turned on, so that's all good. And then I would go to uh, the performance tab. So from here I can see various performance features of, the, of this build and then the build cache tab shows me already that we have a <laughs> really high cache hit rate. 98% um, of the cacheable tasks came from the cache. So this build, as you can see, is really highly optimized. Um, if you want to see details on like, so there's, there's some misses, let's see, let's see what that's about. On the task execution tab, I can actually click down here on, uh, these are cacheable tasks that were executed. So there's only five of them. I click on that. I'm now in the timeline view. And the timeline view is really cool. It shows all the tasks in your build and how they were parallelized, you know, by these, this sort of stacked chart here. And um, what I've done, by clicking on that link, what I've done is I've sort of auto-filtered this view to only show the tasks that I care about. So I'm looking at cacheable tasks that succeeded or failed. They're highlighted in the, in the timeline view, and they also have this sort of list view at the bottom. So these are all the, these are the five tasks that are cacheable but didn't come from the cache, and I want to know why that is. Um, if my goal is to uh, pick the lowest hanging fruit, what I might do is I go to over to order and pick longest. And now I see at the very top here, this is the longest running task that was cacheable. And I'm gonna, that, this is where I would start as a, someone who's maintaining the build to make my builds faster. Now in this case, I could, I could guess that this task didn't come from the cache for a good reason. Probably some code really did change, it had to be rebuilt. So that just makes sense. But in the general case, I can't necessarily guarantee that. And this is where I would start for as, as far as like lowest hanging fruit. Right. So, so we use this with the dashboard to find what are the longest running tasks in your organization that developers run the most, right? And, right. and that's where you would kind of start yeah. as far as the low-hanging fruits go. Yeah. yeah, And just something that may not be clear to people is that um, build scans are super extensible. So all these, these things at the top here are all tags. Um, these tags are custom tags that we add to our build scans. And you can do that too if you're a build scan user. It's very easy. Uh, similarly for these links, these are all custom links. And there's even custom values which are just key value pairs. So I know, you know the branch name and um, the get status, for example. This is all really useful context when debugging uh, build issues, including with the cache. One question uh, we have with regards to that, right? Mm -hmm. um, will 
parallelization of the gradle build affect the build cache, especially for parallel test cases? Yeah, it, it doesn't matter if it's parallel. In fact, one really interesting thing you might see, um, which I saw once a few months ago, is <laughs> if you have, uh, so the way parallelization works is you have various modules of your build all running in parallel, all being built in parallel, um, in the right order, of course. It's actually possible to have um, one of those pipelines, so one of those modules will build something, and then another module in a different parallel you know, stream of work could actually pull that same artifact, task output out of the cache and use it itself. So you even see caching within builds sometimes. And that, that'll happen, of course, only if the inputs to both of those um, tasks are identical. But that can happen. And it's, it's really cool to see that in, in practice. It means the build cache is just like, works really well. Yeah. So it's no, the build cache is no magic pill, basically, right? You need monitoring tools to kind of stay on top of this thing and, yeah. and, and get the most out of it. We'll get some nice juicy examples um, coming up next. Oh, we've got a poll. All right. Okay, so... This is our final poll, so I think. It's like, who has used a build scan before? Who is using Gradle Enterprise? All right, so this poll look, results are in. A good amount of folks uh, have used build scans, so that's great news, right? Um, 50%, well, 31% is what are build scans, right? So uh, we we uh, we'll spend some time at the end, maybe, to to go deeper yeah, sure. into, into build scans, and and uh, yeah, we we highly uh, recommend you check it out, and and we use those tools well for as Tony showed to debug cache misses and get the most out of your cache. So I'm going to be honest here. Uh, this used to be uh, two slides, but it turns out it's really hard to talk about detecting cache misses without also talking about debu um, debugging cache misses. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to do some live demos right now and show you what this stuff looks like in practice with real builds. And uh, at the bottom of the screen, you see a variety of, of links. Again, those are all collected at the end in one big slide. Uh, but in particular, the ones on the left are links to Gradle uh, build tool source code. So you can see what we actually use ourselves for extending build scans, and it's pretty cool stuff. It wouldn't be a great webinar without some command line stuff, so let's do that. I'm going to run some builds locally and show you what it looks like when there are issues. So let's run a build. Um, by the way, this is the last time I'm going to type Gradle W because it's too long and I want to have um, better keyboard performance. Uh, clean check. You had a question here. We, we don't need to uh, be a Gradle Enterprise user to use build scan. That's correct, yeah. Gradle Enterprise is a collection of your build scans on prem. That's correct, so, yeah. That sits on premise. So, once again, if you want to try it out right now, just run any Gradle build from the command line, add dash dash scan, it'll look like, like that, and you get a build scan. And, and it does go to our, you know, our cloud, right, basically, right? Our, uh, our, uh, Amazon instance. So it is somewhat public, right? So if you're working for a Wall Street bank or something, <laughs> that might uh, uh, <laughs> might not be too happy with uh, you sharing that information. You might want to... Uh, but you can delete them, so that's, keep that in mind. Yeah, yeah. And as far as sensitive information being sent, right, it's from what I understand, it's, it's the, the, the libraries are in the build scan and... and it, it's just build metadata, nothing, no source code is included, yeah. um, just data about the build itself. Yeah, yeah and it'll show the library. It, it'll show if you're using some secret library that, uh, you know, you're working on uh, flying cars and nobody should know, right, that right. might be in there, so... But yeah, but as you can see, the URL has this sort of, um, you know, sort of crazy hash, so it's security through obscurity. Right. Um, so I did the first build. I'm going to, I've made no code changes, so the second build should have pretty high cache hit rate. Let's do it. And I see, in fact, that um, actually eight... Actually, let me do one more thing, um, just to make it a bit more... There we go. So I'm going to put on console equals plane, just so we can see this um, a bit, in a bit more detail, because that build was so fast, it's hard to see. So what we see is that several tasks um, had to be executed. This one, uh, compile Java, for example, test was executed. and Given that I made no code changes, I would have expected these to come from the cache, but they didn't. So I want to know why that is, um, and to dig into that, I can look at the build scan. And, and we do this sometimes with our users, right? We call that the, the, the cacheability test, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Uh, yeah. it, maybe maybe take, a, take a second to talk about that? Sure. On um, how basically how it works is if, if you, it's a, it's a no-op build. A no-op build should do nothing. Since it did something, something's wrong, right? So um, then you use build scans and, and some other uh, Gradle Enterprise features to dig into why that might be. 
So that's what I'll do right now. Um, you see already that some interesting things about this build scan. I have a cache miss tag, and I'll show you how that works later. It's just a custom tag, but it's pretty interesting how it gets computed. That's cool. And then there's this custom link called git commit scans. And what this will do um, <laughs> is actually pretty neat. One thing it's going to show off is that every aspect of the Gradle Enterprise UI, the view, is basically specified by the URL. So that means it's really easy to do custom links that do all kinds of crazy things. And in this case, what I've done is th that custom link, this git commit scans link, will show me all of the builds that are on the same git commit, which can be really useful for debugging cache issues. Furthermore, this particular build started off a build comparison. So I can actually, um, this is the build I just ran. I can compare it to this one. So a build comparison is, like a, is, is I also call it a build diff. Just like a git diff, it shows you everything that is different between two builds. So if I go to compare, I now see this, um, this build comparison view. And in particular, we're focused on the, the task inputs tab. So we see that there are four tasks that had different inputs between these two builds. And you know, once again, that's, that was unexpected. There was a, it was a no-op build, so why has anything changed whatsoever? And, but the build comparison tells me exactly what changed, and I can, um, that's just super useful. So for example, we have this create source task. It has a timestamp property. And it's, it's very convenient when build authors use, uh, use names like that, because then I can know exactly what's going on as a timestamp that's going to change with every build. But sometimes they're um, not quite so, so nice to us, and it might be a different, uh, different name that's harder to understand what's going on. Um, this is process resources task. I can actually drill down into this, and I can see a lot of detail about um, this, this task input. So this is a file property with um, what we call relative path normalization. And to understand this, you need to understand that when, when Gradle is running a task, it'll normalize the inputs, all the inputs to every task. Um, sometimes the normalization is basically nothing, where it doesn't, does no work at all. And other times it'll do various things like, it'll treat um, the path to that file input as if it were a relative path, or maybe as if it were an absolute path, or in some cases uh, the path doesn't matter at all, and only, only cares about the name of the file. Or in other cases, the, the normalization is, called, um, is just called none, which means it doesn't even care about the name of the file. The, the file name can change, only the contents matter. So in this case, we have relative path normalization to a, a file name, buildinfo.properties. And so um, like that's weird. I want to know what happened here that made this task um, run. So what's really cool about this is, uh, first of all, you should know that this, this view only has like sort of the hash of the content, not the content itself. So that information is a bit harder to get at. But I can really easily just cat this file and see what's going on. So let's, let's do that. And what I see here is that this file has a timestamp and a username. So um, I wanted to include the username here just to show that it's not always a timestamp that's the problem. Uh, so what we can see here is that this, this file is a problem for two reasons. One is that it'll change on every single build because the timestamp will always be different. And uh, it'll also change on every single machine. Not everyone's named Tony, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately. So um, every, this, this means that this task, um, the inputs aren't relocatable across machines. And I'll get more into that later. So we see that issue. We can look at the compiled Java task itself. Um, it also has an issue, which is that it has a, a generated class, which has a name only normalization. Because in Java, we don't care about the path to files. We don't care about the name of the files. And uh, this class has a problem. Let's see what that looks like. So I'm just going to copy this, save myself some typing. I can cat that as well. And generated. And here we see the problem was once again is a timestamp. So I know this might seem like it's a trivial example and who would do this, but I see this in practice all the time um, in real world builds. Um, a great example of this is um, in an Android build, they were actually, um, the, the normalization to the file was fine, it was as it should have been, but the file contents contain like a unique ID or something. And that was just a mistake that someone made years ago, and, and no one noticed until they had this, this great tool, the build comparison, to dig into it. So this is, this is the thing that you shouldn't do, because it'll make the, uh, the build catch work much less effectively. And then finally, we have one more thing, which is this test task, which I, again, I didn't want this to run twice. I wanted it to come from the cache the second time. And I see that it has two things going on. Um, it's, a, it's a runtime class path normalization. And what this means, uh, there's two kinds of class path normalization. There's compile class path, which is things required to compile the project. And then there's the runtime class path, which is what's needed at runtime. Um, this, is th this runtime differs from compile class path in that it also cares about resources. So again, it's this build info thing. And um, one, 
just to make uh, this point a little bit more strongly, you might think, why is this file even here? Um, but I'm sure a lot of enterprise Java users understand it. You might need some kind of audit trail. You want to make sure that you can audit every build, and so you need some kind of data about that build, and that's what this file is for. But um, it's unfortunate that it impacts the cacheability of the task, but we'll show you how to solve that later. But so that is, that is why that exists. Okay. And, and yeah, it took me a while to, to kind of get that one, right? Uh, uh, and you know, you, you want to, you build something, right? And, and it should be up to date. It should come from the cache. It's not. So that means some things are, you know, just to recap, right? Mm -hmm. So some things are changing, right, in these task inputs. And we're using that build diff to find out, hey, what has oh, changed? Yeah. And where does it live? Which file is it basically? Yeah. And then you can you can correct those really easily. Because find it's like finding a needle in a haystack once your project gets fairly large, right? Right. Yeah. So so what I just showed you was an example of actually running a build and then observing an issue like in real time. I saw that this task was not up to date, didn't come from the cache, and that confused me as a user. And so I wanted to dig into that, and that's what I just did. Now the next example I want to show is a bit more proactive where we, you know, we, we turn the cache on for the first time and we want to, to see how cacheable our build is. And one great way to do that is what I call the relocat relocatability test. And what that means is um, for the, the remote build cache to work well, uh, task inputs must be quote unquote relocatable. So they have to be able to locate from one machine to another and that should, be, should still be valid. It should be agnostic as to where it ran. And, um, so this is the test that, that when we're doing great enterprise trials, right, mm -hmm. and proof of concept, this is that test that we, that we run as one of the early parts of the process exactly. to see kind of what's going on. Exactly. And so the way that works is I will simply, um, I'm going to make a copy. Uh, this is like a sort of cheap, a cheap way of doing it. If I'm going to copy that whole project to a new directory, I'm going to go back into the original directory. I'm going to run the tasks. So Gradle clean check. Okay, so that would have populated the cache. This is how the test works, basically. So you run the task you want to, to, to check, and then you change to the, the directory of the copy. So CD copy, and then I'll run the same task again. And what I see is that a number of tasks had to be executed, um, more than I expected. And so um, to dig into that, oh, actually, I think <laughs> I think I ran the wrong test. What I really want to do is um, clean. Start with this one. There we go. Oh, clear. It's not clean. So I'm going to clear the cache locally, and that's just an alias, by the way, for um, for basically just removing some some cache artifacts locally. So I, I ran the wrong task. So it's Gradle um, clean. I have this task named again. It's really helpful when people give tasks uh, such useful names. Okay, there we go. Let's run that again. Okay, so here we see that way more tasks were executed than I expected. I thought this would have been um, all coming from the cache because it was, what, what I'm trying to get at here is that you have the project in two different directories, so there's different absolute paths to the project. So what this test will do is it'll flag any issues with absolute paths to your um, task inputs. I'm going to do another one of these things where I'm just going to look at a build comparison between these two things. Yeah, okay, and then what I'll see is in this task inputs comparison, I see that there is a, a file called config.properties with absolute path normalization. And so this is really common. Absolute path normalization actually is the default uh, for historical reasons. And so if you do not, if you're creating a custom task and you don't um, specify the, the path normalization for that task, it's going to, uh, by default, pick absolute path, which means that the absolute path to the property matters. And so obviously, if, if, if I have my project in two different directories on my local machine, we'll have different absolute paths, right? So that means the task is no longer, the inputs to that task are no longer relocatable. And that, if it breaks locally like that, it'll also break remotely. So it's going to have an issue with the remote cache as well. And so, um, yeah, so that's a really easy thing to fix. Let's actually go into, um, this is my uh, IntelliJ. I'm going to uh, navigate to that task. I see there's a task called unrelocatable task. And, oh, someone commented that for some silly reason. So let's uncomment that. Now we know it's a, it's a config file, so it has, there's no need to have any uh, no, not absolute path, not relative path. It's just a, a no, no sensitivity whatsoever to that, that file. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to rm, rf, just remove that copy. I am going to uh, copy it again. 
I'm going to go back into the original project directory. I'm going to clear my cache one more time just to make sure it's clean for this test. And then I am going to uh, run the task. So it's gradle clean on, I'm going to type, make it a little bit faster so it's untask. There we go. Let's go into the copy directory, run it one more time. And now we see that that came from the cache. So let's see what it looks like in practice. Once again, I'm going to do a build comparison. Here we go. The inputs are identical. So that, that fixed the problem. So that was a really straightforward thing to do. And once again, it's, it's, it's a, that was a trivial example for demonstration purposes, but it's really common to see that in practice. There was uh, one other example I wanted to show here, which is um, uh, sort of uh, what you can do to sort of, again, proactively sort of um, flag issues for later, for later debugging. So uh, if you can instrument these builds in a way. So let's see what that looks like. Right, see what I mean by that. I'm going to go to, this is, this is once again is the performance dashboard. Uh, cache examples, go to my cache examples project. And I'm going to refresh. So these are all my builds. <laughs> Many of them are very fast because they're just help tasks. I'm going to look at, uh, I've got a custom tag called cache miss. And here they are. So um, what I've done here is I have, um, I'll show you the source code for this. So again, this is my, this is my build.gradle file. I have a lot of interesting stuff in here. By the way, this is a great example of ways to torture Gradle. I have many uh, bad practices in this file just for demo purposes. So if you want to, we'll share this code with you guys later so you can see um, how you can make Gradle unhappy. Um, but yeah, way, we have some Gradle gurus on this webinar. They might just call you out on this, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's fun making, making Gradle suffer. So the way to, to do this kind of custom tagging is basically um, the sort of Gradle that, uh, task graph thing. Um, I'm not going to go into detail on this because it could be Rory Cotty kind of running low on time, but uh, there's, this just demonstrates how easy it is to add custom tags based on criteria you define um, to your Gradle build scans. So what I've done here is I basically said um, build cache is on, uh, there's a cache miss that I didn't expect and I haven't tagged it yet, so let's tag it with cache miss. So that's what, that's what we see with these. These are all, these are all um, tasks that I expected to come from the cache but didn't. And I can even, I'm going to show you this as well. Oh, there's a really neat thing you can do where you can sort of negate certain um, criteria. So I want to look at only non-dirty builds. So when I, when I say this, what I'm saying is I have a, uh, if you look at some of these scans, they have a tag called dirty, which indicates that the git status is dirty. And I don't want to look at those. I want to look at only those tasks that have um, no, no dirty status, which is just kind of a cool thing that you can do. And then what I would do is I would actually just do a, a build comparison. So I can just compare these two builds. And again, it's the same view you saw earlier. There's a lot of reasons why this, this build wasn't cacheable because of all the various um, <laughs> pathologies I introduced for demo purposes. But it's, it's neat that you can actually have um, a custom tag like that to help you, like every so often, every week or so, you can go back and look at these issues and, 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 and resolve problems um, in a more proactive fashion. So um, cache misses, right? So what, what, do we, what do we need to do here to um, get more and debug these and, yeah? Yeah, sure. So um, I've, I showed you some of the issues. I already showed you one way to resolve an issue, which is changing the, the path normalization to certain task inputs. And um, there's one other thing I haven't shown yet, which is uh, this idea of runtime class path normalization, which is a, pr a pretty cool uh, tool. So let's see this in practice. Um, I'm going to run some builds. Again, G is just an alias for Gradle W. Uh, I go, so I'm going to run this twice. So I'm going to do a comparison again. And I mentioned this earlier, but you see in the test task, it has this um, runtime class path normalization and it points to this build info properties. Now I want this file to, to exist. I want it to be there for auditing purposes, but I don't want it to impact the success or failure of a test because it, does, it doesn't have any impact on that. So I don't want it to make the test not cacheable. So um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use my super secret flag I introduced. And um, you know, if, if only this were something as part of Gradle core, we could just tell our tasks to be stable, but this is something I've added just for demo purposes. If I do this again, do it twice, so the second time should come from the cache. Let's do that comparison. Oh, 
Okay, and here we see that um, this no longer shows the issue with the test task um, not coming from the cache. In fact, the because you don't see it on the screen, that means the test task have the same inputs for both builds. And so what we've done is we have, if you look at the timeline view, you can even see it. You know, it's over here. Testing came from the cache this time. So the way I achieved that was by using runtime class path normalization. And so what you would do is, right, you'd have this block of code here. So we basically just tell Gradle that build info.properties is something that can be ignored for this, for this kind of uh, test purposes. And obviously I have it wrapped because I want to have fun with Gradle. So there's uh, only one more thing to show for you guys, which is we wanted to, um, I brought this up the, earlier in the presentation, but there, if you have a distributed team, it's going to be very interesting for you. If you want to be able to um, have multiple nodes, so you've got team members in Europe and in Asia and in America, and obviously if you have just a, a single remote cache node in the US, um, because we're limited by the speed of light, uh, that caching will not perform as well for the Europeans as it will for the Americans. And so to resolve that issue, uh, Gradle Enterprise supports this idea of having like a sort of a cache node network. And we can replicate um, data between these two cache nodes, so, uh, these multiple cache nodes. So I want to show how easy it is to set one of those things up. I want to take a moment. Uh, there we go. So it's super easy to set up. It's just a Docker command. So that's all it takes to set up a remote cache node. And now I can verify that it works by going to localhost. There we go. Okay, so this is, this is the cache node UI. Um, you would connect it to Gradle Enterprise by uh, editing these fields. And you can see how, uh, obviously it's empty, it's a new cache. Um, you can configure it in various ways. So it's, uh, it's super easy to set up a remote cache node. Um, just as simple as a Docker command. And then of course, if you want to take it down, you can just you know, Docker um, remove or whatever. Uh, one, one question I have for you, Tony. So what if you've enabled this remote cache and uh, Bo from our team is at Starbucks and he's running this massive build and it's slow. Mm. How would we know, right, uh, you know, that, hey, his build is slow because his network sucks <laughs> from, you know, Starbucks in Asia? Sure. Well, an easy way to see how that what that looks like is just to go on the performance dashboard screen. So here I would see that, for example, because there's no free lunch, right? Everything has some cost. Uh, the build cache for the Gradle build is actually pretty low. You know, we're spending very little time uploading and downloading and zipping and unzipping um, our, our cache artifacts. So this is how you would actually keep an eye on the overhead of the cache and the, um, the sort of the network speed. Right. And in, in an actual build scan, you could see that as well, right? Yeah. I mean, this data is coming from somewhere. So I can pick one that has a high, high value, for example navigate to it, um, go to the performance tab, then build cache, and then we see all the aspects of that, like how long things took, how many, um, how many objects were packed and unpacked, for example, the network speed as well. Yeah, right here, five. Right, yeah. so that's where you would determine, hey, maybe I shouldn't use this remote cache from Starbucks uh, in you know, my local neighborhood or something. Yeah, you could keep an eye on those issues like that. All right, great, okay. So we just jump into the questions? Then. Let's jump into it. All right, do you want to take it from the top? Yeah. All right, let's do it. Is Python supported for build cache? Some explanation. Mm. Well, there are um, several Python plugins for running There's Gradle build. There's Py, Py Gradle plugin that the uh, LinkedIn folks open sourced. Sure, so I guess as long as the, the plugin is well written and the tasks are, are well written, then they, there no, there's no, should be no problem with caching those tasks. All right. Yeah, so the person who, who, who asked that, uh, yeah, feel free to email us. Yeah. Or uh, send us a build scan, mm -hmm. and we'll, we'll take a look at it. Yeah, in fact, uh, that's a good point, Ruz. Um, if there are any, any problems that you have, the first thing you'll hear a Gradler say to you is send me a build scan, because it is our number one tool for diagnosing these kind of issues. All right. Okay, let's jump into um, uh, this one. Uh, so the reliability of the cache depends on how well we define input-output tasks. All defined tasks, uh, ill-defined tasks may create a debugging hell with the cache producing fake false positives. What do you think? Uh, yeah. So that can happen, yeah, if you have an ill-defined task. Um, it's not something I see too often in practice. I, th I think the question you're asking is, um, is it possible to sort of poison the cache? 
And um, if you want to be really deliberate about it, of course, you can do anything you like in the world. Um, but that is something I don't see too often in practice. Like all of the Gradle core tasks, core plugins, um, very well defined. Um, and there's even, if, if you're, if actually, if you're a plugin author and you want to ensure that that isn't happening to you, you want to make sure that you um, apply in your plugin the, great, the Java Gradle plugin plugin. And um, what that will do is it adds a task to the check task, which verifies that all your tasks are well defined. So if you're a plugin author, definitely make sure you're using that plugin for your uh, plugin development work, and that'll ensure that your tasks aren't well aren't poorly defined. Got it. All right. And if that wasn't clear, you know, uh, uh, send us a follow up. All right. So next one: How can we enable Gradle cache on Docker containers? Did did we already ask that? Yeah, it, it just works. Doesn't matter where it's run. Yeah. And, and there's a tutorial, I'm sure, somewhere. Yeah, in fact, I can show it to you guys. It's, it's, um, this is all it takes to enable the cache. That's it. Real uh, properties, just turn that on, and you're good to go. All right. So uh, here's one with a Gradle Enterprise question. In Gradle Enterprise, how can I see the build cache activities from build cache admin? Um, this person specifically wants to see details of latest cache events have uh, IP, but it has the same IP address, I guess it's from F5 for all requests or something. Does that, does that mean? So what we have here is uh, Real Enterprise has really like two aspects to it. There's the build scans, which I've already shown you a lot of information about, and there's also build cache administration. So from here, we can see how the build cache is being used. And so in the past 24 hours, we see that the cache hit rate is very high for the built-in cache. And we even see all the other cache nodes that our team has available to us, you know, California, Frankfurt, Germany, Sydney, Australia, and um, so you, this is a one useful thing to look at to see how well the cache is performing over time. You know, 24 hours, seven days, 30 days. We can look at the various nodes attached to um, to our cache. I'm sorry, to our Gradle Enterprise instance, and including uh, so the details about these nodes, so I can see, you know, what the cache size is, the maximum artifact size, all these interesting things. I can even see. Um, latest cache events, so I know um, what's being evicted, what's, what was amiss, things have been copied, that sort of thing. So there's a, f a huge amount of detail you can get if you really want to get down into the weeds on this. There's even like a health monitoring section. Yeah, and if, you, um, if you're interested in a particular artifact, you can actually take, copy this key, plug it into entries, and see what its status is. All right. What do you got next? All right. I am also building JavaScript, NPM. When I remove packages from the build, will they also be removed by the cache component? Or do they stay in the cache pollution until I run Gradle clean in my CI build? Hmm, interesting question. I think this gets back to our earlier um, slide about the sort of the difference between the binary repository and um, uh, the build cache. However, I think that with NPM, um, we actually have an example in the Gradle docs about how to cache NPM tasks. And it, it won't just sort of hang around forever. One thing that happens with the build cache is if a cache artifact that you saw here under the nodes, um, these are sort of all the, all, the, all the activity on that cache, what you'll see over time is things get evicted, right? Um, there's sort of an L least uh, recently used aspect to this. So if thing hasn't been used for a while, it'll get evicted from the cache. It won't, it won't stay around polluting you forever. It will go away and your, your cache size, um, you can specify the maximum size you want for your build cache, so right here. And uh, that'll keep, make sure your cache doesn't grow out of bounds. All right. Um, here's a question about tagging build scans, right? How can I tag for each build scan with a unique ID? Is that? Is that uh, sure, you can do that. So um, I'm going to go back to uh, build.jbuild. What is that? Yeah. So um, this is my build.gradle for this, these examples I've been showing. Um, there's various tags I have. So for example, I'm tagging uh, the branch name. I'm tagging if the status is dirty. I have a, I already showed you the tag for, um, let's see, where is it? For the build cache miss. If you want to tag someone with a unique ID, that's, you can do that as well. Like uh, you could easily tag with the commit ID. So I could, I could just add that um, down here, for example, tag. And now what we'll see is if I run this build, uh, there we go. Yeah. Uh, I just 
uh, check. And now what we see is that this build has that git commit as part as one of its tags. So you can easily tag something with a unique ID, like a git commit, very simple. Okay, uh, it was a question about you, you know uh, what command used in one of uh, your command line demos here. Wondering what's the command line argument you typed for seeing verbose output? Mm. Console dash dash plain? So um, if I want to run any given thing, so normally you see this sort of rich view where it just has this, um, it's you know, very attractive, but if you want to see all the tasks um, in a bit more uh, detail, you can just dash dash console equals plain, and there are a variety of um, arguments you can supply, not just plain, there's rich, there's auto, so that's how that works. And if you just, uh, if you just Google um, the Gradle command line parameters or something, you'll find uh, all, this, all this documentation on our, on our website. All right. Do you have a tutorial to enable Gradle cache on an Android project? Is it different mm. from uh, Android and Java? Um, as, as far as, as enabling? No, as far as enabling, there's no difference whatsoever. Um, there's a bit of a difference in how it's used because the Android plugin is different than the Java plugin, um, but there's no difference in enabling it. It's the exact same thing. As I showed you earlier, it's just as simple as, as this. That's all you need. Okay, easy. All right. Um, do you use ephem ephemeral build agents, or is there a more efficient way to take mm -hmm. advantage of the Gradle daemon? Up-to-date checks, local build cache, etc., and CI specifically. Right. So at Gradle, we do not use ephemeral agents. We actually have persistent CI infrastructure. We have a number of agents, dozens of them. Um, and dumb question, uh, uh, I have in code. What are ephemeral agents? Oh, they're just things that sort of they spin up for a build and then they spin back down when the build's over. So they're they're like mayflies. You know, they exist for a moment in time, then they're gone. Um, and that, you know, it has benefits for this sort of immutable infrastructure idea, but it does have a performance penalty, as we all know. So, yeah, we don't use that ourselves at Gradle. Okay. We we use the OWASB dependency check plugin, which checks dependencies against natural vulnerability database uh, to fail builds that contain security vulnerabilities. That's neat. Right. Uh, using the Gradle cache can skip this task because there's no actual code change. However, a vulnerability in an existing dependency may have been discovered mm. and added to the remote NVD database. So we therefore don't fail the build when we should. Is there a good way to handle this? Absolutely. So if you want a task to always run, what you would do is, but I'll, I'll, so you get a reference to a task, you would say um, task uh, up to date when, false, done. Now the task will never be up to date, it will always run. All right, easy. But don't, don't abuse that because you don't want to just do that willy-nilly. It'll really make your builds a lot slower <laughs> Right. in the general case. Yeah. All right. Is Gradle Enterprise required to use a remote build cache? For projects that use Gradle, um, it is not required to use Gradle Enterprise to use a remo the remote build cache. You can, in fact, set up your own remote build cache node and, and just use it. The problem, of course, is that you have no monitoring then. It's really hard to see how the cache is performing and then to verify uh, issues with it. So, but you can do it. Which part of the system decides, does it make sense to cache query cache or not? Speaking of those tasks that should not be cached. Does that make sense? So you want to know which tasks should be cached? Is that the, that the question? Yeah, so does it make sense to cache slash query cache or not? Which part of the system decides that? Oh, so you as the build author decide, or the plugin author decide which tasks to make cacheable. So uh, to make this really concrete for you, I've got some custom tasks in my build script, and I have to tell Gradle that they're cacheable. If I, if I don't have this annotation, if that's just not there, then that task will not be ever used in the cache. Um, but in addition to having the, this annotation, you have to specify the outputs and inputs, and um, then, it, then it just works. But yeah, you have to tell Gradle. It's not... It's not a. It's an opt in, not an opt out. Right. But some tasks are cacheable right out of the box, though. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. If for some reason you didn't want a, a, a task to be cached, similar to this um, thing here, you'd say, cache if. Um, but I, again, don't use that. Don't don't overuse that because it's uh, going to cost you. So. Uh, does it make sense to have CI builds running, build all the time, to have cache always warm? Yes. We do that ourselves. As I showed you earlier, and I'll show it again, um, if you go to the performance dashboard for Gradle, 
enterprise for the, for the Gradle organization, if I just look at the past, this is the past week, I think. Why did I say no scans found? Past week. There we go. Um, we see that just in the past week, there's about 10,000 builds here. Um, so we are running Gradle builds all the time to make sure our cache is warm. Every single build has that, that sort of seed task in it. Uh, what are reasonable allocation of build cache overhead? Oh, <laughs> so this, this value right here. Um, that's a good question. It, we don't have any sort of like a hard number for what makes sense. Um, I've seen this be much higher in the case where there was a team that had just a single cache node in the US, uh, but they had developers in Europe. Um, the downloading time was you know, several seconds. Um, and that was unfortunate, but they know what the solution to that is, which is just to move the, this is add a second cache node uh, near their European developers. One thing that you should keep in mind, which is not obvious to many people who first see the performance dashboard, is that this overhead number, you do not need to do manual math to figure out the true benefit of the cache. This, this remote build cache value here of 56 seconds already accounts for this four seconds of overhead. So you don't need to do math yourself. So this is still a benefit, you know, without having to account for the, the four seconds of overhead. All right, uh, what is your idea font? All right, we have somebody who <laughs> liked your idea font here. Uh, this is Fever Code. Um, <laughs> I like it for the, uh, the font ligatures. So you see, um, yeah. All right, how would we use the build scan to debug while a clean assemble works while an assemble doesn't? So that would be a situation where I would, again, I would use the build comparison. Um, you, what you would do is a, which is a great enterprise feature. Right? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So you could trial it. There's a 30-day free trial that you can do if you if you needed to. Uh... Yeah. So what you do is the, this this build comparison feature is more than just for cache issues. If you have a failed build and a successful build, this is a fantastic way to see what makes the two builds different, and then you can from that point reason about what may have caused the one build to fail. The really common scenario that we see all the time. And, and one of the reasons I think we, we, we made that, where we got so many questions of, hey, this thing uh, passed on CI and it's failing on my machine. Absolutely. My colleague ran this build and it passed and it's failing when I run it, what's yeah. going on? And one issue there is if, if you don't have Gradle Enterprise and you need to debug a CI failure, that's gonna be a real big pain in the butt, right? You have to run a clean build. It could take half an hour, depending on how complex the build is, or an hour, or who knows. Just, to, re just to reproduce Just to reproduce it, it. it, and then good luck if it's a race condition. But with build scans, we have a persistent record of every build in your organization, which makes it dead simple to see what's going on. So you can find that crazy, weird anomaly failure that happened three months ago that Frederick ran. Yeah, and you can even filter um, this view to show only failed builds, for example. So we can do that. Yeah, and we can even do that per, per user. Let's not embarrass anybody right now, but... Uh, <laughs> it's just taking a while to load. All right, um, let's see here. Uh, what else? Uh, how would you put your Maven repo and your build cache to their best uses? Interesting question. Um, well, I think this whole webinar was about that, right? It was about how to make the best the of the build cache. Out, yeah. Right, if you have a more specific question, feel free to ask, yeah. but... So you can't, you're, so the way you showed us, right, to recap, you're, you're looking at the cache misses, right? You're looking at cache miss percentage. You're looking at the tasks, mm -hmm. right, and the task execution, mm -hmm. right, of the build scan, mm -hmm. and, and seeing what's, so those are the three ways you, know, you kind of approach. So my question to you, I'm gonna throw one in here for you, Tony. So what is your favorite, what is your go-to, right? You have a build scan, and the cache hit rate is low, What's your go-to? What's the first thing you do? Yeah, so that's a great question. I mean, I, I, and, and maybe show us one. Can we find one of your builds in here, and uh, and see how long your builds are? <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to do that. All right. Um, okay. Well, but, fair enough. Fair enough. But yeah, the first thing I do is absolutely. Um, so, if we go to the cache examples project again, just to simplify the view, um, I do really love this this uh, custom link that I have added to my build scans, which lets me see all the other builds on the same commit, and then it populates a comparison for me already. So from here So I, hold on, but so what, why are you doing that? Uh, main motivation. So the idea is that if, um, let's say that I'm first build of the day, uh, I get to work in the morning, and I know that the exact commit I just built on my computer was already built on CI. And I'm like, the cache rate does not look like what it should be. So this is, this is, this is precisely what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go to the build scan, 
create a comparison against the CI build, and then see what the differences were in the inputs. And then from there, I can, I can make all kinds of um, you know, judgments about how to, how to improve that. It's something that I do a lot with, um, with the Android plugin. And I've, <laughs> not to call them out or anything, but I have um, filed a number of bug reports against the Android plugin over the past few months um, to help improve the cacheability of that project. And um, it's going to be, for any Android developers out there, I, I think you should expect big things from the build cache for Android builds um, over, this, over the summer, basically. Yeah. And, and is the, the caching of transform tasks, is, that's, that's in? That's in yeah, so some of the, it'll be, I think it's, it's coming in 3.5. Yeah, that's Android that's plugin 3.5. Yeah, yeah, it'll be caching those transforms. Save a lot of time. What's the difference between Android and Java plugin from Gradle Enterprise perspective? Um, again, Gradle Enterprise and BuildScans don't care uh, which kind of plugins you have applied. It'll show you all the plugins that have been applied. Like if we look here, we can see all the plugins applied to a build in a build scan. We see that this one has a build scan plugin applied. It has a Java plugin applied. Um, for an Android build, it would say have a very similar look. It would just also show you the Android plugins that have been applied, like the Android, com.android.library, com.android.application, and, and the feature plugins as well. So you, you, you would just see them here. That's the right. only difference, really. Uh, all right, uh, another question. Android Gradle plugin had a build cache functionality separate from Gradle's build cache feature. Mm. Is this still relevant? And how does this conflict with Gradle's build cache at all? Right, so there's no, confl no conflict, uh, confliction? <laughs> no conflict um, whatsoever. Um, the, the Android build cache stuff is uh, complementary to the Gradle build cache. The way that works is it's sort of like a workaround for the Android team for issues in their transform tasks. It sort of caches things within the task as opposed to Gradle caches tasks themselves. That Android task is for within a specific kind of task uh, to help avoid some work. And that will actually be removed eventually in favor of the Gradle build cache like as a, as a sole solution um, probably sometime this year. All right. But yeah, they're complementary. They don't impact, they don't conflict at all, just to be clear. I almost forgot this one. So one of our Gradle gurus, old friends of Gradle, is on here, and he disagrees with you oh. on uh, some areas when you should not, well, in cases of disabling the cache, okay. right? So one, he's saying, hey, rebuilding when there are environmental or system dependencies that are not properly captured with caching. Right. right, so every one of you knows your build better than I do. So if you know for a fact that your build has certain things that aren't captured well by the build as it currently stands, then, then, you're, then you're right, I'm not right about that. Um, but what that means is you can probably make some improvements to your build to capture that information as, as properly as, as proper inputs to your tasks, and then maybe eventually once you've gotten to that point, you can turn on caching. But yeah, I'm, I'm not going to tell anyone that uh, they know that I know their build better than they do. Right, and, and so he continues, right, proving that fresh baseline builds can work from base dependencies and source code schedule build that validates that the build environment is stable and works end to end. Did you get that? <laughs> yes, no. What's the question exactly? So, prove, so this is another time where you should uh, not use the cache, right? This is with response to cache should always be on, yeah. right? Uh, in bold that you had put on that slide, yeah. right? <laughs> Which, yeah. yeah it is, it is a bold right assertion. Right that's, yeah, it is. Uh, so proving that fresh baseline builds can work from the base dependency and source code. Okay, sure. If, um, if that's important to you, you can, an easy way to, to do that um, on an ad hoc way is just say Gradle, um, check, you know, no build cache, and there you go. So uh, if you want to have the cache on for most circumstances, but for every now and then run a build without the build cache, you can just do that and that'll solve that problem. What about third party tasks, right? One of the things he mentioned is those can be problematic because you don't know who's, who's written those, right? The inputs right. and outputs and whatnot, everything could be all over the place. Yeah, so um, I, I showed this earlier, which is that caching is an opt-in, not an opt-out. You have to annotate your task with cacheable task for it to be a cacheable task. If a third-party plugin author has done this, it's sort of, it's on them and also it's on you. If you are the build maintainer and you are just adding someone's plugin without checking out what it is, I mean, you can, you can file bugs against their, their repo saying, hey, you should fix this, there's an issue with your tasks, 
but you know you, you can't you shouldn't just be adding libraries right to your project not knowing what they are we've we've seen issues with that in the past where people are just adding any 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 old thing so um, you know you should vet your third party dependencies right. And what about for using Gradle in deployment scenarios where just caching doesn't make sense at all? Is that something that, that yeah, folks so should worry about? We, we do have, um, so we use the cache, as you might expect, religiously, yeah. um, for even, even for deployments. And we do have also very large um, customers who use it for deployments. But for some people, it's, uh, it's a step too far to deploy a bill that's been cached. And so that's fine. If, if, if that makes you uncomfortable, there's nothing to say that you have to use the cache in that case. You know, run all your CI, most of your CI builds with the cache enabled, all your developer builds with the cache enabled. That's already saving you a ton of time. But for that critical time when you're going to deploy your final binary, just uh, you know, run it without the cache. If, yeah. that, if that makes you feel more comfortable, totally you should do that. Right. Yeah. All right, I got another one for you. Myself, personally. A hard one. Okay. I don't know if you're ready for this. How do we know if someone is not using the cache? Let's say someone is uh, you know, for whatever reason, reliability, I don't trust it, I don't want to use it, I just love running clean, I just like typing those words. How would we know if someone is not using the cache? Okay, so there's... Um, Without checking individual build scans. There's a, couple, is there a way? there's a couple things you can do. If you look in the source code, which I will make available to people after the talk, right, so there it is. So um, one thing you can do is this is how you know if the cache is enabled for a build. So what I might do is say um, uh, def is cache enabled, and then tag um, if not is cache enabled uh, build scan dot tag um, no cache. So it's as simple as something like that. If I want to track whether builds have the cache turned off. I'll just, I'll just check this, and so I'll show you this in action. Um, let's run a build with the cache off. Of course, it's a failure, so I'll probably type something wrong. Oh, let's go get rid of this for now. No, I, I didn't say it was going to be easy, but uh, so <laughs> far, it's, you, you're making pretty, you're making pretty live demos. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's always, the best. Always trouble. It's um, the best. <laughs> All right, so here we see no cache. So now what I could do is I could go to my performance dashboard or my scan list and just search for no cache. Wow. Ah, and then that Tony guy, he's, he's running builds without okay. the cache. But, but you needed to have this kind of set up in before, so if you wanted to kind of cache this. Yeah, you, but if you, it, so that's for caching, but if you want to also check on clean issues, like we shouldn't be running clean too often, right guys? So yeah, we, can, we can already search hey. for people. And we already have that in the system. So these are all the builds that have clean uh, turned right. on, and I could easily see who's running yeah. these clean builds. Oh, it's a TC agent guy right. <laughs> on right. CI. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. So you can query clean, right? For for Java projects, right? So so we uh, uh, for for Android projects, we query assemble debug, right? As hey, this is the, the problematic task that everyone wants to improve the, the build times of. It's a great representation of local builds. But what about for um, developer builds in Java, right? What, what, what are some cool things to search for and filter in our dashboard to, to you know, find, hey, I want to improve local developer build times for a particular project, right? What are some interesting things to filter for to kind of really narrow this thing down? Because you have incremental builds, right? So your the average build time is all over the place, right? So w w what do you do, Tony? It's a hard one, I know. We're still trying to figure it out, but I'm wondering what you do here. Right. So um, here I've filtered uh, the performance dashboard just, just so local builds. And again, this is a custom tag, uh, easy to set up with these custom tags, as I've shown several times now. Um, so I'm looking at just local builds in the past day. Um, if I'm concerned about developer productivity, you know, I could look at only failed builds, or I could look at only the slowest of builds, and then I would dig into that to see, um, this is, looks like a sanity check build. So you can see lots of interesting data um, from the build scan to really help you figure out what's going on um, in, in any given build. So um, I know a lot of a Mac with 12 cores, all these flags are turned on, I even know who ran, oh, who ran it, Grail ran it, no, who ran it? There it is, ah, Luis ran this one. And there's a way we could see who has the slowest builds in our organization. <laughs> Let's not do that online, but okay. So we could do we could do that. Yes, yeah. you could do that. Yeah. Well, the, the, I mean, the simple way of doing that is just to look at the the performance dashboard. I take away this filter and look at the past say past say week, 
Right, and, and that's what we use to catch build time regressions as well, right? Hey, something's going on, how do we help this person? It's not a <laughs> spying mechanism, but it's more of, hey, let's one or few folks make everybody's builds fast kind of a thing. Yeah, so you already see this couple spikes here, and if I wanted to, I could dig into that and see what's going on. All right, here, here's another one from our, one of our friends, Great Old Guru here. I've run into a few issues with custom init scripts and setting runtime parameters, like caching. Right, uh, what, are, what are your best practices there? Um, yeah, so we do recommend using uh, init scripts for setting up, setting up things like that across you know, all builds on your local machine. Um, as far as best practices, I'd say that's a good thing to do. Um, what are the, I would like to know what these specific issues are before I could really answer that question in more right. detail. Okay, well, we, 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 can, we can message him about that. Uh, would you recommend caching results of shadow jar tasks? Um, in general, we don't cache jar tasks for the reasons specified. It's just moving stuff around, which is just as fast, if not faster, than pulling from the cache, which is, again, just moving stuff around. So, What about NPM install, node modules folder? We actually have an example. Um, in our documentation for how to cache the an NPM task. So it's something that you could totally do to save some time. By default, local cache is maintained in user slash username dot Gradle. If the location is moved to a network drive instead, would it be safe for multiple developers to use, use it concurrently? Oh, absolutely. Is it thread safe, essentially? Yeah. So for sure. Um, the way that the ca local cache, well, the cache works in general is that uh, it's sort of like first, first win so I'll show you what it looks like. Um, this is my Gradle cache. If I just list them, you see they're just these hashes, right? So assuming that if you believe that our hashing strategy is good, <laughs> which I do, um, what that means is that for there to really be a collision here, there would have to be identical inputs. And in that case, it doesn't matter which one wins. If the first one wins, that's fine. Um, and it would be completely okay to share this, this um, build cache directory across the whole organization, which is what the remote cache essentially is already. All right. What hardware VM specs are, you know, what, what are the hardware VM specs to host Gradle cache now? Mm. And then if we go down, so this is already the manual to show the specs for Gradle Enterprise itself, but for the build cache, um, yeah, you would just basically like uh, go to this page and it shows all the information you need for that. I'm trying to find the right link. Um, it's probably in the before you install, maybe. Yeah, um, but it's, it's, it's basically here somewhere. Um, yeah. We have all, all those specs publicized in, the, in our documentation. Yeah. So documentation in general, this is where you would send folks. This yeah. You'd send folks here. So. Um, Docs. So gradle.com. Docs. Docs. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was a plugin user manual. Uh, Here we is, go. Is there a difference between Artifactory build cache and Gradle Enterprise build cache? And this person is referring to not the repository, right. you know, binary repository cache. Yeah. Um, do, so do we have any data on that? We don't have any good data right now on how they differ. Um, we, we believe, based on some ad hoc testing, that ours is faster, but I don't have any sort of information to, um, to really prove that point right now, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, I think that's, that's all we have. Yeah. Right? Uh, we, don't want to miss your, we don't want you to miss your flight, so we should uh, uh, cut it off soon. Thanks, for everyone, for attending. Email us if you have any other questions. And uh, anything else, Tony, would you like to say? No. Uh, thanks for attending, everyone. It's been a good time. All right. Great. Thanks. All right. Have a good one.